Hello and welcome to On The Curbs. I'm your host, Team Albus Daly. Joining me this week is European Le Mans driver Hugo de Wilde. We caught up recently to chat about him racing against Dennis Hauger, beating Theo Portrier and Oscar Piastri in single-seaters, why he made the switch to endurance racing, how his debut season has gone so far, and much more. So without any further ado, let's just get straight into it. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So, hi Hugo, thanks for being here today. First of all, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Just back from a race week last weekend at home, training and getting ready for, for the next race. So thanks thanks for asking. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. And good to hear you are as well. So first question I'd like to ask everyone I talk to, what first got you into motorsport? Oh, it's it started from my family. Basically, my grandfather was racing some rally rallying and then my father raced a bit as well. Basically, a journalist. Okay. So he's working for Formula One, WEC, uh, WRC. So he's passionate about this and he gave me this passion. So when I was a child, at some point, I think I was three and a half. He, turned, he, he brought me to the karting track. And since then, yeah, it become uh, it become a passion for me too. So very young age, but that's most racing drivers these days. <laughs> yeah. So you started out in single seater racing, if I'm right, and you're competing against the likes of Dennis Hauger and Theo Porcher, we now see in Formula Two. Were your original ambitions F1? Yeah, 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 for sure. My my goal when I started uh, single seater was, I think, the same as everyone to get in Formula One. But, uh, you know, I'm not coming from a wealthy family, so it's really not easy because this sport is all about money and contacts uh, always, especially in single seaters. So I did I did great things. I did two years of uh, Formula 4 where I, I was competing against Theo Porsche. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I ended up vice champion and he was third, so I was in front of him. <laughs> And then I did the uh, two seasons of Formula Renault Euro Cup, but I never could go in the top teams because of lack of, of uh, money and budget. So at some point, I think it was, I accepted that, you know, without the money, you can't go in the top teams. And without being in the top team, you can be the best in the world. It's hard to get noticed and to win championships. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to, yeah, maybe it was better to go in endurance racing. I say, like you say as well, um, especially these last couple of years, Teo has been a tricky person to beat, shall we say. So the fact that you can do it but still not be able to make that step just shows how frustrating it can be still because of the money side of things. Yeah, that, that's that's the point. But, you know, at some point, I, I def at first when I quit single seaters, I was really frustrated because I know I had, I mean, I had the potential to be there and to fight with these guys. Uh, no question about this. Uh, but now today I accepted it. And when I see even Theo is struggling to get into F1 and yeah. he, he has a lot of things for him, you know, he's good and he's in a good, um, in a good mood at the moment and even him is struggling. So now yeah, I'm just wishing him the best and I hope he can get into F1 like that. I can say that I, I you know, I beat mm. him, uh, Formula 1 drivers. And if not, he can come to endurance racing, you can beat him again there. Yeah, who knows? You mentioned Formula Renault Euro Cup. I want to talk about that a little bit. What was those two years like for you? Oh, it it was it was. I think no, I can say it was good uh, for sure. I didn't achieve the goals I had. So, but as I said, I couldn't be in the top teams. So I, I was driving with midfield teams, and considering this, uh, I think we did we did good results because first of all, I became the youngest race winner ever in 50 years of uh, Formula Renault. So this is also amazing because it's me and then you have like Lando Norris and George Russell. So <laughs> That's not a bad also a nice, Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a nice start. So yeah, we won the very first race um, in my rookie in my rookie season, first race I won. And then it was a bit more, a bit more difficult in that year. And then the, in the second year, I did, I think, three or four podiums. But um, yeah, it was hard to be consistent. That first win, then, did you think, oh, this is this is easy then? Or were you thinking, maybe not getting too ahead of myself yet? Or Yeah, honestly, you know, I, it was just after the Formula 4 season when we were already fighting every weekend for podiums and wins. So, I, you know, I prepared it very well. 
and I was feeling ready to to step up and yeah it was it was weird to win straight away against big names like Oscar Piastri for example um and yeah at that point my, my goal before the first race was to end up in the five first of the championship and then I was thinking oh fuck maybe we can win straight away uh, we can fight straight away for the championship but then you know the the reality came yeah. and uh, it was a bit more difficult uh, it's nice to, nice to have that thought for a moment, though. You can just think maybe it's possible. Yeah. So then there's so many different breeds of motorsport out there. What made you want to switch into endurance racing with the European Le Mans series? Uh, first of all, I think it's because the cars, so the prototypes are the closest car to single seaters. Uh, I really like mm -hmm. downforce and aero cars and fast cars and uh, LMP3 and now LMP2 is really, really close to single seaters like Formula Renault or Formula 3. Uh, so that's that was one of the main reasons because I wanted to keep um, driving with the downforce because I learned how to drive with downforce in single seater. And then, and I think I did the, the right shows because when you see now all the manufacturers which are coming in endurance, uh, it's I think it's a good place to be even if you know it's it's true that there was the gt option as well mm. and it might be easier in gt because actually you drive for a manufacturer so if you drive in gt3 and you do a good job but maybe the one manufacturer can see you where for example this season in lmp2 it's oreca but you can be the best out there it's it's hard to get noticed by a prototype manufacturer yeah, definitely. And it's it's a little curious that in some ways, because it's kind of LMP2, in some ways you think it may be a little bit trickier um, than some of the other, not, not that there's anything easy about the other categories, but it's curious how there's that, uh, that room for advancement where, and it's more straightforward because you have these massive manufacturers in there. So it's a, it's a curious one. Is it weird having to race different categories on the same racetrack during the same race? Because you're obviously LMP2, you race LMP2, but you've got all these other cars there. Yeah, it was, it was not easy, uh, especially last year. I, I started in LMP3, so I, I had to overtake the GTs, but I had to be careful of the P2s quicker than me. Mm. So that was the main thing to learn, uh, switching from single-seater, the, the traffic management. Uh, now in LMP2, it's much easier because you are basically quicker than most of the other cars. So mm. you just need to look forward. And uh, But yeah, it's, it's still not easy because there are like amateur drivers in, uh, in GT and in MP3, also in LMP2, but a bit less. And so sometimes, yeah, it's hard to predict what they are going to do. They want to do kind things to not uh, disturb you, but in the end, it's even worse. So yeah. that's something you always need to keep in mind. That's, for example, if every time I take my stint, it's the end of the stint of the bronze and the amateur drivers in GT. Mm. So I need to know yeah, it's not a pro driver and that's for sure um, impact how you are going to, to overtake him. What you're saying about traffic management and about the drivers there, so what has that transition from single seaters to this form of racing been like for you? Have you? How long did it take for you to get your, your head around this new system and... Are there still moments now where you kind of have to remind yourself, or is it more or less smooth that smooth that now? No, no, I'm getting used to it. Um, I think it's it's. I mean, overtaking a car, even if it's the same car or a GT, a P3, or single seater, one overtake, it's always kind of the same uh, thing. Uh, the only thing I had really to learn is in endurance racing. Sometimes it's better to be a bit more patient. Uh, not, for example, if you take uh, turn three at Barcelona, which is a long right hander. If you want to go around the outside, you can do it, but then you will pick up all the marbles and the bad thing on your tire, and then you end up losing more time that mm -hmm. if you lift, stay behind the GT, and then maybe you lose 1.5 seconds there, but then your tires are still clean. And if you want to go too quick and overtake him straight away in the bad uh, part of the track, then your tires will be not good for maybe two or three laps, and you will end up losing more. So that was the thing I, I needed to learn sometimes to be a bit more patient, but in the end of the stint, it's it's more, it's it's faster. Were you quite keen to overtake in the early days then? Sorry? Were you quite keen to overtake everyone in front of you in the early days then? Or Yeah, I mean, coming from single seater, you you are used to every every time you can go and overtake, you just you just do it. And that's what that's the thing I needed to learn, especially last year and still this year with the P2. That's yeah, as I said, sometimes it's better to be a bit cooler and think a bit more than uh, going immediately for a gap. So, we touched upon the money earlier. Would 
that be the most challenging thing for you to have had to overcome so far in your career or would there be something over a course of a race weekend that has been in terms of racing pure racing more difficult for you and how have you managed to get past that uh yeah to me yeah, everything is kind of money related because the problem with motorsports is if if you want you know i'm someone i always want to be the best and to mm. train more than the others the problem is if you want to train more if you want to do a test day for example it's immediately a lot of money so if you don't have the money you can't train more you can go to the gym and do simulator for sure but mm. it's not the same than when you are you are in the car so first of all yeah you have Sometimes drivers that are less talented than you, but which are every single week in a race car. And so when you jump in the car, you are surprised because they can match or even sometimes beat you. And so that's the first point, which was quite frustrating. And then for sure, the money, if you have more money, you can go in better teams and it, it helps in everything. So, and also the pressure, because as I said, I have, I have no money. So I had to find always partners and sponsors and you have always that pressure that, okay, will I manage to find that much that I need to do the season? And then if you manage to find it, then you need to deliver because you know that mm -hmm. if you don't deliver, your partners will, will stop helping you. So that's, yeah, money and, and the pressure that money puts on you is really the, the most difficult thing to manage, I think. I think so, definitely. And it's one of those frustrating things you say, if the results don't deliver it, then it makes it more difficult to get new sponsors or partners on there. Which like, oh, why did the last one do? No, that's not important, but just, just trust, exactly. trust me. But it's, it's one of those things, unfortunately, with modern day motorsport. Um, coming back to this year, though, how has the season gone so far from your perspective? Uh, from a personal side, honestly, I'm really, I'm really happy. Uh, I could I could adapt really quickly to the um, LMP2 coming from LMP3. It was it was a big step, but it I was like a natural expecting... step up. Yeah, exactly. It's just like yeah, it's bigger, it's faster, more downforce, but it fe it felt natural. I was I was a bit scared to me a, a really big step and to be struggling to adapt. Well, actually, it took like one or two runs to understand a bit how the brakes were working because it's different brakes. Or the TC was working, and then you are straight away fast. You are not super fast, but you are straight away in the in the good pace. And then I had to learn from my teammates and working with the engineers to you know find this last tense. But uh, no, I'm quite happy about my performance at least in quali and in race pace. Uh, but then yeah, I think uh, I have still things to learn for sure on the tire management. I learned a lot this year, and I can still learn traffic as well. We talked about it. <laughs> Last weekend, we had a racing incident with a GT, which cost us the podium, you know, and I was yeah. in the car. So to me, it's, it's like, yeah, it's racing incident. It can happen, but you don't want these things to happen, even if you know it's part of the game. So now thinking about it, I was, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I could, I could have done this or I could have done that. And in terms of results, you know, it's, it's not easy because it's the team first season. It's my first season. It's one of my teammates first season in LMP2. And uh, <clears throat> LMP2 has a lot of level, a lot of teams which are really weak as well. So we did a podium, so that's really positive. Um, but basically, we are always fighting for top five, which is good for our first year. And every time something happened in Barcelona, we had a brake sensor issue, which cost us one minute. And so we are P9. Uh, in Spa, again, we were fighting for the podium. We had that contact. And then uh, Monza. Monza was good, P3. So, yeah, I think we have really a lot of potential. Everyone is learning, but we just need to put um, everything together, which will be the goal uh, next week at Portimao. And as well, from what you say, the, the brake issue, the, the contact, these aren't things that are necessarily your fault as a driver either. They're just things that happen in the race that could happen to you, that could happen to anyone. It's just about managing that. And you can learn stuff from that, certainly, but there's not so much you can do about it, if that makes sense. Whereas if it was... You went wide to a turn three as far or something. You know what you've done there, so you can work on improving that. But I suppose is that difficult or easy to try and manage them when you have a disappointing result, but there's not much you could have done about it. Yeah, it's 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 not easy. It's really you know what what happened uh, one week ago at Spa. It's you know sometimes you can't really do nothing about it. But even if you can't do nothing and it's not your fault, you still, if you are in the car, you still feel that it's your fault mm. because you were the one behind the, the steering. So, but it's not easy. But at some point, no, you know, I work also on my mental. Um, so 
I give myself, you know, maybe one or two hours where I can be really disappointed and I don't want to talk to anyone. And then you have to accept it because you cannot change it. So you need to accept it, uh, try to learn from it if you can learn from it and immediately get ready and use that as a motivation to be even stronger in the next race. And like you say, you've got that consistency there, at least you're always fighting for top five when it's going your way a bit. And even when it's not, you're still kind of not far away from there as well. So what do you think your ambitions for the last race of this of this season in Portimao? Oh, I think podium. I think the podium mm-hmm. because in Barcelona, we didn't test it there and we were already fighting for top five. Spa, we didn't test it there and we were again fighting for the podium. But Portimao, we've been testing. We've done two days of testing there. It's the okay. last race of the season. So... We've learned a lot, you know, and that's that really will be the goal, I think, um, because all the drivers, we feel ready. We learned already on the driving when we went testing. Same for the team. We found some good things on the setups. So, yeah, I think the podium will be will be the goal to end up the season on a high and show everyone that we learned and we, you know, we end up with a podium. So, so fingers crossed that goes that way, then that'd be quite a good, nice way to finish off the season, I think, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. A couple of fun non-racing related questions to finish off. First off, if you could get a ticket to any show or event, what would you choose? Mm. I think, you know, in Belgium, we have one of the biggest festivals in the world, which is called Tomorrowland. Mm. I think I would like to go there one day. It's in my country, so I have to close close by for you. (laughs) Fair enough. And final question, would you rather always buy 10 things you don't need every time you go shopping or always forget one thing that you do need? (laughs) Uh, I hate forgetting things that I need, so I would say the first one. (laughs) Fair enough. That's, yeah, at least you never know that some of that might come in handy then you might actually find that it's useful. So it works out, hopefully. Exactly. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I want to wish you the best of luck for Portimao and hopefully we get to see you back in European Le or maybe even WEC in 2023. Yeah, thank you very much. That will be the goal. We'll be fighting hard and give everything. So let's see. Thank you for the interview. Thanks again to Ugo for coming onto the curves with me, and I want to wish him the best of luck again for the future. Join me again soon, why don't we chatting to another famous face from the world of motorsport. And in the meantime, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, and check out the other interviews on the On The Curves YouTube channel. If you want to hear more from me, you can listen to me chat about F1, amongst other things, over on the Undercut podcast, and you can also hear me dissecting everything Nitro RX related, including chatting with special guests, over on the Nitro RX podcast. Both podcasts are available here on YouTube as well as over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you like to listen. You can also follow me over on Instagram at t.elvis.daily.onthecurves and read my various motorsport articles over on Is It Fast and Paddock Sorority. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again next week for the next episode.